eve of the Indian budget and you're on the eve of the first test match between India and England. <laughs> you have been doing very badly in sports recently. But maybe you are in luck as far as the budget is concerned. What have you gauged talking to various people? Well, I think it's an exciting time, of course, as it is in any country when a government has changed, when there is a real expectation uh, of reform, particularly in the economic area. We've been through our own experience of that. We've had our ups and downs in sport, but we did pretty well in the Olympics when we hosted <laughs> yeah. them uh, yeah. two years ago. Um, but in the economy, too, we have had a difficult period and are now coming through it very strongly mm. in the UK. And so uh, I've been here this week with the Chancellor of the Exchequer, our Finance Minister, particularly trying to boost trade and investment, as well as all the links in education, for instance, between the UK and India, and we are very excited about it. You know, you, you have written about it. We are expecting wide-ranging change in India. What wide-ranging? Could you specify? Because well, India is a democratic country, the wide-ranging change set out by the new government. It's not for us to determine No wide-ranging change. You are expecting what? Because the previous government, what, is, what difference are you expecting between this government and the previous one? Well, the, the government of India will set out its policies, and as you say, it is about to set out its budget. Uh, but clearly in their election campaign, the new government have set out programs for change, for inclusive development, and have raised expectations in this country and the world uh, that India will be able to release more of its enormous potential, of the potential that in Britain we really believe in. That, of course, is entirely for India to decide how to do that. What we are saying is we're ready to respond to that. In, the in fact, you are here in full force. There have been 50 ministerial visits, uh -huh. and four of you, in fact, two uh, you yourself and uh, Minister, uh, uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer, mm -hmm. Mr. Osborne. Mm -hmm. So you, you think coming in pairs is more effective? Well, we come in groups partly because we all want to come. Yeah. Uh, and when the Prime Minister, when Prime Minister David Cameron was the new Prime Minister, many of us came with him. So we, uh, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, George Osborne, and I thought that there's a new government here. There is a big opportunity for India and for the UK to help the prosperity and the future of both countries, let's come here and talk about it. And we appreciate the fact that the, the Prime Minister and many other ministers have made themselves available to meet us and to talk about these things. You met the Prime Minister today? Yes, we've <coughs> been with Prime how Minister you, Modi. How did you size him up? What, what? Well, I get, I remember I am a, uh, the diplomatic representative of my country. Yes. I'm, not, I'm not going to make political yes, comments. Yes, no, no, just um, as a, but, as a uh, chemistry. How he struck me as, a, well, we have very good uh, chemistry. We had a very good discussion uh, mm. with him and, and, today, and also with the finance minister, with the external relations minister, and with many other ministers. I think there is a real determination to succeed and to seize the opportunity and you know we have spoken about our experience in government that you have to do many things that you want to do soon when after you are elected when there is all of that goodwill and confidence behind a new government did the prime minister he he is the first prime minister in our history who said that he'll speak to foreign dignitaries in Hindi. Did he speak yes. to you in Hindi? Yes, absolutely. And yes. you had an interpreter? With an interpreter, which uh, yes. made it, uh, of, of course, <laughs> more yes. useful for me. But yes. of course, yes, absolutely. He's, he sticks to his commitment. Yes. Well, then it is time. If you want to do business with uh, Narendra Modi, it might be suddenly you will have a minister who will surprise everybody by speaking chaste Hindi. Well, maybe. And uh, actually, we brought with us uh, Priti Patel, Member of Parliament in Britain, mm -hmm. who the, the, our Prime Minister has appointed as a champion for the Indian diaspora. In mm -hmm. We're very proud of the one and a half million Indian diaspora in the uh, UK. And she was having a few words in Hindi with the Prime the, Minister. In Hindi, maybe in Gujarati, because you've, you've gone into the parochial detail, because Patel means she's from Gujarat. Gujarat, well, it was, yes. <laughs> which is where. Yeah. Mm. Uh, 
what are the areas that you find that you have to seriously surmount? I mean, there are problems. We are there's a lot of promise, as you say. Mm -hmm. People are looking forward to. There's a lot of goodwill for mm -hmm. for Britain, mm -hmm. and yet there is a huge problem in, for instance, in education. The Indian students visas. Uh, it's very expensive. Time was when the entire Indian elite was manufactured in in, in your universities. Mm -hmm. Now they've they've strayed. Of course, they've gone to the United States mm. since the seventies, and you've lost that huge advantage. And you, I keep hearing about uh, we had, we want Indian students, but it comes down from forty thousand to thirty thousand to twenty thousand. Where um, is the? Mm -hmm. What can you do? Well, the numbers are turning up again now, and I'm sure they will go up further with what we have made clear on this visit. For instance, I have announced many more scholarships mm -hmm. for talented Indian students How many? To, to come to the UK. Uh, these are, we've announced 700 scholarships on this visit. Now, I know you are talking of tens of thousands of people, but this is where we actually provide the funds for people to come mm -hmm. to the UK on high-quality courses. There is no limit in the UK on the number of students who can come from India. And they can't afford it. Well, now, this also is an important that is a point, problem. because, uh, of course, we tend to have three-year courses, whereas many other countries have four-year courses. Mm. And so when people say it's expensive, they also have to calculate mm. how many years they are going yeah. to pay it for. So I actually think that Britain, with 30 of the top 200 universities mm -hmm. in the world, mm -hmm. no limit on the numbers who can come from mm -hmm. India, we, it, it's still a great opportunity for Indian students. We have cracked down on bogus colleges, mm -hmm. um, but that was because that wasn't good for the students involved. Mm -hmm. They were being yes. misled yeah. about the mm -hmm. education that they were receiving. But we've put that right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I think people have got the impression that you were just talking about. That is but I want to make clear to them that expensive, and they can't do jobs. That is, if they were able to work and pay back, because otherwise it becomes far too expensive. And there's always the law of American universities or Australian there's campuses. Certainly, there's more choice in the world than there has ever been, in, which is a good thing. And so, of course, it means people go in many more directions, and the proportion who go to Britain will go down, therefore. But it, it's still a great opportunity. We will still welcome them. And when you ask about jobs, those who've been students and get a graduate-level job mm -hmm. can get another three-year visa and another one after that. And now, so the graduate-level job means 20,000 pounds yes, a 20, year or more. Yes, that's no, right. That's difficult, isn't it? Well, actually, we have many talented students from India, yeah, yes. and so many of them do fall into that category. So, again, there remains a big opportunity, and, and I'm pleased to say there have been, I think, 275,000 students from India in the UK over the last 10 years. Yes, numbers have gone down, they're starting to go up again, and some of the announcements I've made on this visit, I think, will help that. You also met the National Security Advisor, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Mr. Dawal. Mm -hmm. Did you? Did he share with you his experiences in <coughs> Mosul and in Iraq recently? Well, we did talk about Iraq. I have just been to Iraq as well, yes. just ten days ago. I've been in Baghdad and in Erbil. So. Did you have a rendezvous with him in Iraq because he was there? Well, I didn't meet him there in but Iraq, and of course it's been very important for India that there have been people who have been kidnapped in Iraq. I'm very pleased that the nurses who were taken have, have been able to return to India. Uh, we will always give any help we can on issues like that. But of course we discussed the situation in Iraq, the need for the Iraqi leaders to work together, the Shia, the Sunnis, the Kurds, more effectively than they have done in recent years, mm -hmm. to combat a very serious terrorist threat. What do you make of this uh, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, this ISIS, and uh, h how much of it is hype, and how much of it is real present danger? It is, it is a real present danger, there is no doubt about it. You this. mean to say a caliphate is around the corner? Well, no, I, 
I don't know what is round uh, the corner in those terms, but I do know that this is a very serious threat. This is a mortal threat to the state of Iraq, and so its leaders must come together in, in a, such an emergency situation. It's very important to do everything we can to cut off any financing uh, to ISIS or ISIL, to stop them using the economic assets they have seized, to try to stop people traveling to and from uh, fighting for them. That's something we do as mm -hmm. Britain. We will confiscate people's passports. Mm -hmm. We will try to stop them going fighting there. So yes, the world has to face up to this, and in particular, the leaders of Iraq have to do so. Mm. You realize, Secretary, that the three year, I mean, since August, August 2011, the, the, what has been happening in Syria and it came to knots because everyone was given to understand that soon uh, Bashar al-Assad will be out of the way and there will be regime change and that did not materialize. Then you had the elections in Iraq where again somebody you thought might not be the Prime Minister is the Prime Minister. Now out of this frustration You've got all this huge laboratory in Syria spilling over into Iraq and now you have one corridor from here right up, in fact, up to Lebanon. Uh, which, so have your policies and Saudi policies in Syria also boomeranged in this entire region? Well, we've been trying to support in Iraq and in Syria people who are moderate and will be inclusive. Clearly, we haven't succeeded in that in Syria, as things stand today. Um, but it's very important to keep a, a moderate opposition in existence. Otherwise, people can only choose between Assad and terrorists. Mm. But there are many sensible people in Syria. And so we give them support. We don't send them weapons, but we give them support to, to keep them going. The world collectively has failed to deal with the Syria crisis. I have said at the United Nations, we have failed to deal with this uh, crisis. The Security Council has failed because there hasn't been enough agreement among the Security Council with Russia and between Russia and the United States and the rest of us. We will keep working on that because we need Russia to put the pressure on the Assad regime to embrace a political solution. If there isn't a military solution. There's now only a it's, political gone, solution, it's gone beyond so. that. It's no longer just Assad. It's now the whole corridor from Iraq right up to, and in fact, Jordan. And um, well, we will. Get, we are giving a lot of assistance to Jordan and to Lebanon. We have to make sure that other states in the region can protect themselves. When you mm -hmm. met B Nur al Malaki mm -hmm. in Baghdad, did you get the impression that he might? be making, be willing to make the, the adjustment, might be willing to, I mean, he won't say that I'm going to vacate, mm -hmm. but, but what you're looking for is another man in his place, am I right? Well, we mustn't try to choose the Prime Minister of Iraq, that is up to Iraqis. What is clear is they need a new and inclusive government in Iraq, and they haven't succeeded in doing that. In How do you, what are the years. modalities? How do you go about what, what well, they, they, have a, they have a constitutional process of their own to follow in which they now should elect a speaker who normally comes from the Sunnis and then a president who comes from the Kurds and then a prime minister who comes from the Shia. Mm -hmm. And I did find a strong consciousness among most of the people I met there that they do need to come together. Um, this is what you have to expect in any country facing such a serious... Unlike event. the Americans, you have opened your embassy now in Tehran. We have, yes, that's right. Does well, that we have said we are about to open you're our embassy. About to open. Yes, you, yes. You, you've been there off and on. I mean, you were there, then it closed, then you, you're now opening again. Yes. Uh, does that indicate that you... Did, do you get the impression that the Iranians are about to help in this problem? Well, I, I don't know. I've discussed this with the foreign minister of Iran, mm -hmm. and opening an embassy will allow us to, will make it easier for us to discuss these things with them. We do have common interests with Iran, as on many issues, stability in Afghanistan and in Iraq is a common interest of Iran, the UK, and most other nations in the world. But we look to Iran to change its policies. Iran has supported sectarian or violent groups in other parts of the Middle East, and so actually working together would require a change in those policies. Mm.